Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. So as Yuna said, my name is Sarah Dayan. I work uh, as a software engineer at Algolia, and I really love CSS. I've written tons of it over the last decade. I've written it for many kinds of projects of many different sizes. And so last year, Algolia, we decided to fully redesign the documentation. And since we were rewriting everything anyway, we used it as an opportunity to rethink our CSS. So you see, it had become really hard to change it without breaking things. Every edit felt like adding a Band-Aid. We were no longer in control. So we performed the redesign and we decided to change methodology so we can gain control back. And we decided to go with Utility First CSS. So if you're not familiar with Utility First, it consists of composing complex styles with atomic classes right on the HTML. So these classes usually do one thing. They're single-purposed and they're style-oriented. They tell us what the element looks like. And the opposite of that technique is going component-first. So you go, you go with semantic class names. And those semantic classes, they don't tell us what the element looks like. They tell us what it is. And so you have less classes on the HTML because the classes do more things. Now, when people see atomic CSS for the first time, they usually go like, oh my god, that's so ugly, you're mixing concerns, your HTML is going to blow up, the web should be semantic, do you even CSS? And, you know, I can understand it, but I believe there are a lot of misconceptions about it. So today, I'd like to invite you on a journey of understanding utility for CSS. Let's take a step back and take some time to deconstruct the prejudices that either your coworkers or maybe yourself may have about it. So the first thing I would like to tear down about CSS is separation of concerns. Separation of concerns is an essential pillar of clean coding. You find it in many languages, many paradigms, yet the way we've established it for HTML and CSS is warped. So there's a website out there called CSS Zen Garden, and it showcases the same HTML page, but styled with different style sheets. And the goal here is to show how powerful CSS is and how it can totally change the look of a page. And it's beautiful, I love it. But this is a technical demonstration. It is doing a wonderful job at showing what CSS can do when you push it to its limits, yet, this does not stand up in the real world. The problem is that for too long, this has been advertised as the way you should write CSS. And to me, it's a bit like when my former coworker, Tim Carey, built a search engine in CSS for April's Fools. It is crazy to see that CSS can be pushed to doing that kind of things, but it doesn't mean that it is well suited for real life usage, for production. I believe that HTML that is 100% oblivious of the way it's rendered is a dogmatic vision. It is about checking some best practices checkbox, but it doesn't take real use cases into account. There is no clean separation between HTML and CSS. And in the CSS Zen Garden scenario, yeah, the HTML is unaware of the way that it's styled, but the CSS is very aware. Change the HTML and the style breaks right away. On the other end, you can have HTML that depends or consumes the CSS. And this is what you have with CSS libraries like Bootstrap, for example. You have a library of components as CSS classes, and you can use it in the HTML. Adam Wathen, creator of Tailwind CSS, has a much healthier way of looking at it. He talks about dependency direction. And what I like about that is that it acknowledges the inherent relationship between HTML and CSS. And I believe that HTML that depends on CSS is much more resilient. Take this HTML. So this is a section of a website, and it displays testimonials. 
It is semantic. It uses only a minimal amount of classes when necessary. And here's the CSS that we use to style it. So the CSS here describes the structure of the existing HTML. It is fully coupled to it. Now let's say that we decide to remove the tagline. So this also means that we must change our H4 into H3 tags because we don't want to skip a heading level. But now we have an issue. The CSS that used to style our tagline now applies to the titles of each testimonial. So we have a visual regression. And we need to get rid of that rule set because we no longer, it is no longer useful anyway. We also have to change the selector that used to apply to H4, so now it applies to H3. So as you can see, a simple change resulted in quite a few adjustments. Now let's say we decide to get rid of the testimonials altogether. So we must remember to delete the CSS that goes with it. Otherwise, we'll be left with some unused code. You know that kind of code that a coworker finds six months later and they have no idea what to do with it? CSS is a declarative and global language. When it matches, it applies. It is that simple. It makes it powerful, but also hard to maintain. When it depends on HTML, it needs to grow with new use cases. It needs to be changed when the HTML changes. You need to dust it when you remove some HTML. So this is not maintainable at scale. Instead, I believe that CSS works much better when used as a library. So more than a decade ago, Nicole Sullivan came up with the concept of object-oriented CSS, OOCSS. And it gave birth to component-based CSS with many libraries like Bootstrap, Balma, methodologies like BEM that you may be familiar with already. So OK, let's rewrite our HTML. So here we're using a component-based approach. So every stylable tag has a class that identifies it. If we remove the tagline right now, we could adjust our headings, but it, it would not cause any visual issue. We'd still have to clean up the new CSS, but we don't have a visual regression. All right, so why not stop at component-based CSS? Looks like it's working, right? It does the job. There's another topic that comes along with, compon uh, with a component-based approach, and it's the topic of reusability. And the kind of reusability that you get with a component-based approach is quite limited. Let's take a book preview component written with a component-based approach. So this is the HTML for it. It uses semantic classes. And this is what it translates to visually. All right. Now we want to implement a comment box. It looks similar. We may want to reuse the same classes to avoid duplication, right? But the problem is that this is not a book preview. This is a comment. So we cannot reuse the same class as is. It would not be semantic. So OK, we can refactor it to something more, more generic, let's say a media. This way, we don't duplicate the styles. And we can reuse them on anything. Anything can be a media. Problem solved. Well, not so fast. After a while, we decide to operate small changes in the common component. So now we have to create variations to accommodate for this new use case. Our generic abstraction is no longer generic. Our component approach is starting to show weaknesses. It led us to premature abstraction. Changing it forces us to constantly refactor. When you look at it more closely, most complex UI components are not that reusable. This is why favoring composition is the most maintainable choice. You cannot predict the future. You don't know where a UI will go, especially during the early stages of a project. Look at this UI. So this block looks reusable to me. It's repeated several times. But here's another component inside of it. It could also be its own thing, since it's repeated elsewhere outside of the component. And notice that the one on top has a border. So this means that the component should support a variation. And here's another variation of it, without the background this time. Oh, and check out those two identical pieces of text. They're exactly the same. Should they be components too? 
When I say that most components are not reusable, what I mean is that they are rarely reused as is. They change, they have additional elements, some parts go away, some parts move, etc. The atom is not the component. The component is made of reusable pieces of reusable atoms, but it is not the atom itself. And one way that I like to rethink reusability is to find it in the way that designers build UIs. Brad Frost came up with a really popular approach called atomic design. And atomic design focuses on building design systems instead of designing pages. And it starts from the smallest elements and reuses them to build bigger parts. When you look at how designers work, you mostly see atoms. You see color palettes, font sizes, spaces, grids, gradients, icons. The components that you see in the systems that they have in Sketch or their, their program, the components that you find, they're usually small. They're like buttons or, or badges, but you rarely see as much complex components. Reusing small atoms to compose bigger components is more resilient because it is immune to premature abstraction. Instead of adding new styles reactively, you reuse a well-thought-out library that you built proactively. A good indicator that your CSS scales well is when you don't need to keep on writing more CSS. This way you know that it doesn't grow and you're not risking to rewrite styles that you already have, diverging from your UI guidelines, etc. And this is why I believe in using CSS as a design system, not as a component library. Abstracting into components makes much more sense and works much better in the programming language that you're using on the front end. So that could be React, Vue, could be Ruby partials, PHP with Twig or Smarty. That's what it's made for. If you ever want to delete this section, all you have to do is delete it. The CSS is not specifically linked to it. You don't even have to worry about it. You don't have this extra representation of your component to update somewhere else. All right, but it, it's just like inline styles, like, thank you, Sarah, welcome back to 20 years ago. Well, not because it looks the same means that it is the same. Utility classes are a well-defined API to compose more complex components. You maintain a consistent and limited catalog of allowed styles to choose from. You're not granted total freedom like you are with inline styles. All right, but won't the HTML become super heavy with all those classes? So that's a valid concern. But the super neat thing with compression algorithms is that they do super well with repetition. So when you compress such a file with gzip or broadly, it replaces all the duplicates with references, and then it safely encodes all the symbols with shorter representations. So I actually did the experiment with the homepage of the Algolia docs. I took all the strings of utility classes, I reordered them, and I hashed them to create fake semantic classes, to simulate a semantic approach, because I wanted to compare the file size. And so, no surprise, Uncompressed, as you can guess, the size difference is important. 71 kilobytes between the semantic and the utility first approach. Yet, when you once you compress it, it falls down to between 1.5 and 3 kilobytes. So this is insignificant in terms of file size. But on the other end, the huge upside is that your CSS does get a lot smaller because you have less repetitions. So this is the before after of our transition to utility for CSS on the Algolia docs. And now, yes, this is a 60% decrease, and it may compress to similar sizes, but the parsing and the matching of the CSS engine is going to be much faster because all the classes are only one level deep. So this is super quick for the engine to resolve. All right, but it's ugly. It is ugly. I don't want to put all those long string classes in my HTML. 
Do you remember the uproar when BEM started to become popular? Because I remember it, and I had many coworkers saying, no, I will never use that. They rejected it just because of the syntax. Now, according to State of CSS 2019, this is the most widely used CSS methodology out there. I guess we got over it, the funky syntax. And the thing is that our brain is cognitively biased. We'll always default to what we know and love, and we reject what is different and uncomfortable. This is why I believe that we need to keep an open mind. Cosmetic considerations should not come in the way of a potentially useful technique. All right, can we still use components? Can't we use both? Yes, absolutely. And this is precisely why this is called utility first and not utility only. Utility first is not about ditching components altogether. The idea is that you should start off with utility classes, make the most of them and only abstract when you see repeating patterns. You're allowing your project to grow while remaining flexible and you are identifying actual components over time when the patterns start to emerge. And yes, you're probably going to use tons of buttons, so it makes sense to abstract them early on. But are you ever going to reuse a testimonial block or enough that it's worth being a component in CSS? Will it always look like this in every context? I doubt it. What I would recommend is keeping your options open. It is a lot easier to later abstract a composite style into a component than to try and undo an existing component. And we, as developers, must be the first ones to embrace change. Our industry is still really young, and we are figuring many of these things as we go. Utility first, you know what, I'm not even like emotionally attached to it, it's probably going to be replaced by something much better at some point. But in the meantime, let's try to stay open-minded and do what's best for the industry, for the projects, but most importantly for the users. Thank you.